afternoon, and welcome to the Adler Planetarium. Thank you all for coming today. I'm Dr. Grace Wolf Chase, an astronomer with a particular passion for engaging communities of faith with the wonders of the universe. An interest that uh, has been nurtured, at least in part, through a 35-plus year friendship with the Jesuit astronomers at the Vatican Observatory. I was thrilled to have met Father Carci earlier this year, and I'm very excited to hear his presentation today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the podium over to Father Thomas Bema, Vice Rector for Academic Affairs at the University of St. Mary of the Lake, who will introduce you to today's speaker, Father Carci. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolf Chase. I thought for a long time about how to begin uh, this introduction. And uh, what occurred to me is there's a genre of joke that always begins when you bring two things that don't seem to be together, together, like a priest and a rabbi, they walk into a, a restaurant or things like that. <laughs> well, today we could actually start by saying a priest and an astrophysicist walk into a museum and they sit down in a single chair. <laughs> the Very Reverend John Karchi is the rector of Mundelein Seminary and the president of the University of St. Mary of the Lake. He's a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago and is uniquely situated to address the topic that we have today. The topic, I think, surprises a lot of people, and yet, historically, religion and science were very much fellow travelers in the quest of knowledge. The famous Gifford Lectures, uh, jointly uh, put on by St. Andrews University and the University of Edinburgh, began and really continue as lectures in natural philosophy, which was the predecessor discipline to modern science. <coughs> Father Karchi currently teaches both Bible and uh, a philosophy course in our MA in philosophy program. Uh, an innovative course with the same title as you see before you, Fundamentals of Science at the Foundations of Faith, a course which has been recognized and supported by the John Templeton Foundation. Prior to coming to Mundelein, Father Karchi was director of the Shield Catholic Center and chaplain to, the, to Northwestern University. Uh, he holds a PhD in astrophysics from the University of Chicago and an STD, the theology doctorate, from the Catholic University of America. Today I think you'll find that the seeming opposites of faith and science, at least as uh, our common culture is, speaks about them today, really actually do have a great deal in common. Almost something that is inseparable as the man who will speak to us today, the astrophysicist and the priest who can occupy one chair. Please welcome Father John Karchi. Well, thanks, uh, Dr. Wolf Chase and Father Bema. I have to admit that, and I picked up on this talking to a number of you, if you grew up in Chicagoland, you often have the reaction when you come to a place like the Aquarium or Adler, oh my gosh, it's been years since I was here. And <laughs> That's certainly the case for me. Actually, when I was a high school student, Adler used to hold this program for, I don't know, space and space nerds or something. And I remember coming down uh, for that, and really for me it was the start of a real passion that's been with me all my life. That was in 1933 when Grace was talking about the foundation of the planetarium. But his title says, you know, faith and science and it's such a broad topic. I'm happy to say that it gets a lot of attention these days on TV and publications. But because it is so broad, you know, in a small gathering like this, there's only so much we can do. So if you're hoping to hear about wormholes in you know, 14 dimensions, you're going to be disappointed. But I'd like to suggest that there's such a richness here that I don't care how many Nobel Prizes in physics you might have, to go back and just reappoint yourself with some of the basic things like the fundamentals of quantum mechanics is still mind-blowing. And I don't care how many doctorates in theology you might have. You know, to talk about anything 
related to God uh, is mind-blowing. And it's really putting those two in juxtaposition that I think is an opportunity for us, no matter where we come at on the spectrum to these topics, to once again kind of immerse ourselves in the wonder and really the sheer spectacularness um, that comes about when you bring these together. Now, meeting today is particularly fortuitous because I don't know what you were doing last weekend, but quite possibly you were worrying about black holes, <laughs> gravitational waves, and space-time singularities. Just last weekend, there was a major conference on these topics. International Workshop at, and I'll hold you in suspense for a little bit, here are some of the speakers, and if you're familiar with this area, there's some heavy hitters here. I mean, they're all very important, but George Ellis, Alex Filipenko, Andre Linde, very accomplished uh, cosmologist, uh, Gerard Tuchuf, Joe Silk. Anyways, all these, Roger Penrose from Oxford, all these guys got together and women, and they're talking about black holes, gravitational waves, space-time singularities. Clearly, that happened here at Adler, right? It should have, but... It was at the Speculo Vaticana, better known as the Vatican Observatory. As Dr. Grace Wolf just said, um, there is a, a wonderful affiliation in many of their scientists with some of the folks here. But a lot of people don't know that the Vatican, right, the very same Vatican where Pope Francis is, operates a astronomical observatory. And as you can see, founded in 1774. And these days, you can't do a lot of effective observing from Rome, right? There's light pollution and all kinds of other pollution. So they also have an affiliation with the University of Arizona. But very active, modern research is done. And almost annually, you know, they're holding major, uh, major events, conferences, symposia, to really look at cutting-edge science. And there's also a Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which doesn't just focus on questions of astronomy, but all the sciences in a broad area. This is from the press release uh, of that conference on gravitational waves. One of the aims of this conference will be to encourage a fruitful interaction among participants from both theoretical and observational cosmology. That goes on and on. And at the end there, topics that the conference intends to explore are the limits of modern cosmology and the scientific challenges of the near future. There's nothing in here about the Pope. There's nothing in here about saying, are you a card-carrying member of the Catholic Church? There's nothing here saying, when's the last time you went to confession, or we're not going to let you in. And that's my point. It's just a sheer interest in pure science. You don't have to be Catholic to go to this. You don't have to believe in God to be a speaker at this event. It's the Catholic Church is saying, we are hungry for this information, and we want to bring together some of the best minds in the world to talk about it, to discuss it. In the best sense of the word, and of course, there's always going to be exceptions because it's an institution embodied through fallible human beings, but the rich tradition of the Catholic Church has always said, bring me everything, you know, all the information you can possibly amass. Because if it really is the fruit of human intellect, you know, that should delight God as much as anything. And so we want to learn. Now maybe the take or the understanding of some of that information of some of those participants is very different from that of the Catholic Church. But that's no reason not to avail yourself of the information. When I was a beginning graduate student, this quote came out. This was, uh, it was exciting for me because if there was a recent pope who's been kind of most, uh, really got the ball rolling again, talking about the faith and science dialogue, it would have been John Paul II. And I was a beginning graduate student, and this is from an address he made to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. And I was excited that there was a pope who was actually talking about these topics. Religion and science must preserve their own autonomy, their own distinctiveness. Religion is not founded on science, nor is science an extension of religion. Each should possess its own principles, pattern of procedures, diversities of interpretation, and its own conclusion. While each can and should support the other as distinct dimensions of a common human culture, neither ought to assume that it forms a necessary premise for the other. And I was, as I say, excited that we had a Pope who was paying this much attention to the dialogue. 
But I also remember being a little bit disappointed. Now, John Paul II needed no help from me, so don't worry that I was disappointed. But I always thought we ought to be able to say more than that. I mean, this is respectful. It's kind of saying, you know, you have your realm, I have my realm, and there's a lot we can probably learn from each other. But I'd like to say we can go further than that. Because anything science looks at, if it's looking at the world, it's relevant to what theology talks about. If theology is talking about God or the study of God, then the language you're going to use to have that study is going to be the language of the world we live in. And that's the language of science. Now, can you use science and pervert it and use it in all sorts of ungodly ways? Of course. But that's not a problem inherently of the desire for knowledge. So, my uh, little manifesto is, come out from behind your metaphysical walls. In other words, whatever is physical, at some point, there has to be an area where the metaphysics, you know, the rubber of metaphysics hits the road of physics. And if there are metaphysical truths, and theologians would certainly say that there are, as would philosophers, if they're somehow interwoven in the physical world you and I inhabit, then there has to be some manifestation of what that coming together looks like. Now, traditionally, this often gets um, uh, showed itself in what is sometimes referred to as the God of the gaps. In other words, physics, biology, chemistry, whatever the science might be, looks at the marvels of the world and eventually gets stumped. You know, there's something we've discovered we don't fully understand, and then maybe a theologian would jump in and say, ah, and God is the one who takes care of that. You know, human knowledge can only go so far, right? Hubris, we want to avoid that. And when you get stumped, scientists, well, now you're seeing exactly what God is doing. Hence, there's a gap there in knowledge, and God will fill it in. So this is a cross-section of a chambered nautilus, who is probably rather distraught over being turned into a cross-section. <laughs> but there it is. And we've all seen these beautiful shell patterns. Now you can imagine at one point someone looking at that and saying, that is so intricate, that is so beautiful. Clearly, only God could have come down, almost like with a, a paintbrush, and created such a beautiful, if anything is a manifestation of God, it's the intricacy and beauty of that. Okay, fine. You can say God is somehow responsible for that, but as we come to learn more and more about the world, in particular, in this case, as we learn the chemistry of the calcium atom and how you get calcification, you know, it turns out that this is what calcium does. You know, this is what the stuff that makes up that shell does. It doesn't necessarily know that it's producing a beautiful pattern. That doesn't mean that God isn't involved in some way, but if you simply say, I don't understand it as a human being, I don't understand how you could possibly get such a beautiful pattern unless someone was there micromanaging it, then you've got to ask yourself, any self-respecting scientist would ask herself, well, do I really have grounds for saying that? When you look at the calcium atom and you come to realize, well, this is the kind of pattern you expect to get, there's no reason that that should shatter your faith. It doesn't take God out of the picture. But as I often say to my students, and I'll say here, good science should help us hone the questions we ask as theologians, and they should help us hone the way we understand the answers that we get. So that if I'm simply saying, well, only God could have made such a beautiful pattern like that, you know, stupid atoms couldn't possibly do that on their own, and in fact, I learned some chemistry, what I'm doing is I'm honing the way I ask the question, what is the involvement of God? What does it look like? So while we're on this topic of beautiful spiral patterns, let's look at one near and dear to the Adler Planetarium. Spiral galaxy. We've all seen images like this, right? Uh, go on the Hubble website if it's been a while. Uh, go to the, the Zooniverse website if I can put in a plug that uh, Grace was talking about. It's an amazing site. But here we are. Another example, perhaps, of saying, look at the beauty of that. And it is beautiful. When I was a kid, you talk about an astro geek, I used to have a huge one of these things on the ceiling over my bed. And so, you know, wow, have you ever seen something as beautiful as that? And you could imagine someone saying, again, well, only God could have done such a thing. You know, th these are just non-intelligent blobs of gas and so forth. They couldn't possibly have arranged themselves that way. 
And furthermore, we look at that, and it looks a lot like a pinwheel. It looks like um, if you're ever really bored mopping your floor and you started twirling the mop, I suppose you'd get something like that. And so, you know, common sense would sort of say, well, these stars are, you know, they're all kind of in an arm, and the thing is clearly spinning around, and the stars wind up. Fine, that's a good common sense approach. But as you learn more about the physical world, you know, we know these things are not attached as if they're all part of one ribbon, like a pinwheel ribbon is. And what's actually causing the motion is largely the effect of gravity. And so once you take that and you start doing observations and you're saying, well, if I know something about gravity, then I can calculate what the velocity of these stars should be. And lo and behold, what you realize is this thing couldn't possibly be like a pinwheel where all these things on each arm are sort of connected and they're all just winding. The velocities simply don't work out. And there's something called density waves, okay, that you know, doesn't matter when I have to go into all that. But there are density waves that are different than the trails that you see of the star patterns. And again, nobody's gone out there and poked and prodded this thing, so we're already making assumptions about how we understand gas and density waves and things like that on Earth. How might they apply in the, uh, out in the heavens, out in the universe? But lo and behold, this was something people talked about. It was a theory, it was a hypothesis. But as recently as August, I don't expect to be able to read this, but it was August of 2016, a very important paper came out in Astrophysical Journal Letters, Strong Evidence for the Density Wave Theory of Spiral Structure in Disk Galaxies. Okay, so when you run back to your office after lunch, you can scoop everybody. Because you know that, now, does this absolutely positively prove how those spiral patterns are formed? No, but as all scientific arguments go, take a careful look at the data, a more careful look at more data than someone had done before, and there's really strong evidence to suggest that amongst other competing theories, yeah, you know, the way we've been thinking about forming those spiral arms really seems to be what's going on. And it's not simply the pinwheel type model that, quote, common sense would suggest. Okay, well, we've looked at cross sections of the chambered Nautilus shell. We've looked at spiral galaxies. You know, we're getting out there to the limits of science. But some of you guys have very advanced degrees in theology and science. So let's really push our brains, our minds, even beyond what Adler could handle. Let's take a look at puppies. <laughs> Watch what happens. Maybe some of you have seen this before. Well, puppies, uh, she's about to feed them. Spotty pinwheel. <laughs> That's what puppies do. You put them together. At least these Scotty, Scotty things. Now. Again, someone looking at that would say, wow, what amazing dogs. You've clearly trained them for years, you know. How in the world did you teach them to do that? What complex behavior, you know. How could you, all that's happening locally is that each dog is trying to eat. And the only thing the dog pays attention to is the one, you know, the nearest neighbors. And they're constrained by the fact that there's a food source right in the middle, but this is animal behavior shows what they do. It's interesting when they break the pattern and then they kind of, well, now the food's gone, so that's the end. The point is, this is a very simple and very cute example of something called complexity theory, which is trying to understand how do you get fairly sophisticated behavior, and okay, maybe the puppies aren't that sophisticated, but still, here you see the pinwheel thing and um, I would have guessed you must have trained them to do that. What's happening is locally, each little element is doing something that's just driven by a local environment. The dog is paying attention to what the dog next to it is doing. They're not communicating as a group, right? These aren't the amazing Walendas of Scottish Terriers. <laughs> They're just doing locally what they do. And yet, globally, you see a very beautiful seemingly very complicated behavior. Let's go to something that is a few more than just those five puppies. Maybe some of you have seen this, flocking birds. These are uh, starlings.
appropriate new age music there, but you know, this isn't uh, animation. These are real birds. Nobody trained them. There's no way in the world birds on one end can be communicating with ones all the way on the other side. What's going on is each bird is paying attention to its nearest neighbors. And folks who study birds much more than I have or could, you know, have worked out ways, what are the little signals that each bird is sharing with its neighbor. So complexity theory. Locally, you just have little elements kind of doing their thing, only contributing information with a nearby neighbor, and you get these incredibly large-scale, very beautiful, seemingly choreographed behaviors. Okay. Finally, let's look at a simulation, a very famous simulation of the early universe. So this is literally a you know, computer uh, simulation of what the early universe quite possibly could have looked like after you know, the Big Bang, as you have very hot gas begins to cool, begins to clump into structure. Once again, though, the reason I'm showing you this is you're dealing with physics that we think we know on small scales, and how does that manifest itself writ large, you know, throughout so that we can make what we think is perhaps a model of the entire universe. The clumpings that you're seeing here, eventually forming things like galaxies, um, which obviously means you've had stars. You know, you can pull this up online. It's a very fascinating video. But taking us from puppies to flocking birds to thinking about the universe itself. When I said that you can't have one without the other, the implication being that you can't have science without faith, the faith doesn't have to mean faith in God. But it does mean there are certain underlying assumptions you're going to have if you want to do any sort of scientific investigation. So what are some of these presuppositions? Well, belief that the world is orderly and rational. That if I go out there and look, there actually is some structure that I can discern, or that I can try to make sense of. I may not be very good at understanding you know, how that order is ultimately put together, and that's kind of the march of knowledge over time, but that there is an order to the world. You know, When I look at those puppies, I don't just think that, OK, these are five very special puppies, but if I got five other puppies, they're going to behave completely differently. There's something about puppiness that I can understand. Belief that the order of the world is open to the human mind, right? That when we look out at these things, whether it's puppies or it's starlings or it's the universe itself, I do have a way of grasping and understanding to my level, to my ability, what is there. Belief that the order of the world is contingent rather than necessary. This simply means that the way the world is structured didn't necessarily have to be that way. In other words, it's not the case that every time you put those puppies together, they have to behave that way. There is animal behavior there that I can learn about. I have to go out and explore. Science is based on making observations. Okay, a mathematical system, for example, is well defined. You know, if you have one and one and two, you know, you can sit down in your armchair and you can build the entire mathematical system. You don't have to go out there and check to see if, you know, if 1 plus 1 is 2, you don't need to experiment whether 2 plus 1 is 3. It all is defined together for you. And then finally, belief in the unity and uniformity of the universe. You know, the farthest a human being has ever gone is the moon, in terms of being able to poke and prod. Or it was in that secret, you know, soundstage in Hollywood, if you're a conspiracy <laughs> theorist. But we'll assume they actually went to the moon. But that's nothing, right? That's nothing in terms of the scale, the size of our own solar system, let alone our galaxy, let alone the universe. And so it's this sense that if I think I know how gravity behaves on Earth, I can make the assumption that gravity behaves basically the same way anywhere in the universe. But that is an assumption. That's an underlying presupposition. If you don't have at least that level of assumption, then lots of luck, because every square inch of the universe is going to have its own laws and behaviors, and there's simply no way you could try to do any sort of large-scale uh, observations. So all of those assumptions 
are precisely what you find in the Catholic worldview. If you're saying, and it's not necessarily unique to Catholicism, but I'm speaking here as a Catholic priest, and this is the tradition that I know best, it's this idea if you have an intelligent God who is creating the world, and think of the uh, prologue to the Gospel of John, through him all things were made, that the divine logos, the second person of the Trinity, is in some ways the, you know, the language, the syntax through which creation comes about, then that sense that we can grasp with our minds the order of the universe, that it makes sense, that there's a rationality there, that there's a uniformity, all of that follows from that basic worldview. And so a lot of times the faith science dialogue becomes a faith science duke em out battle where you know, someone is trying to use science to try and discredit faith or saying, look, if science is true, then you really don't have any need for God. And then the people of faith often become defensive or it goes in the other direction where someone's trying to say, look, you know, if there is a God, if we understand the way God acts in the world, then you scientists are overreaching your bounds or let me put you in your place. And a lot of energy gets spent on that. And I would suggest a lot of the so-called faith science dialogue gets spun up in you know, more heat uh, than light, in a sense. Now, that's not the case probably for the people in this room. It's not the case for the ongoing faith science dialogues at places like Adler. But go out into the blogosphere. You know, go out and see what a lot of folks say in these so-called dialogues. And so what I want to do in this gathering is to say, look, let's just suppose, as a hypothesis, that God does exist, okay? Let's say we're over that hurdle. Then what is it that science can provide to people of faith to really help enrich the way they understand and appreciate that faith? Because it seems to me, if there's one area that has been woefully under-addressed, it's saying, you know, don't try to use science to prove the existence of God. Don't try to use science to say, look, you know, this is so amazing, only God could have done it. Instead, use the way scientists look at the world to help enrich and advance the way theologians talk about God. Because I find just in my own experience, you know, as a pastoral minister, we often make all kinds of statements about God that if we just spent a little bit of time thinking carefully about the world we inhabit, we could gain a lot from thinking about God the way scientists don't necessarily talk about God, but just talk about whatever it is they're exploring. So when I say science, obviously that's a huge question, what is science? But I'd like to suggest, and I'm not the one to first come up with these, that there are probably at least three non-negotiables that anything you might call science would have to have. One would be empirical data. Right? Science is always based on what can you see. What can you go out there and poke or prod or collect or observe? You're not just sitting back imagining what the world might look like. So that's a very fun exercise all its own. In case you're not aware of it, there are these bean bags down here. And uh, if any of you feel so moved to just sit back and take one, be my guest. Explanatory theories. So it isn't simply that I go out and I see things. But do I have some theory to try and explain what's going on? So go back to the chambered nautilus. Well, one theory is, you know, God came down and individually constructed each one of those little chambers, and he does that for every shell on the seashore. Another theory is, well, when calcium carbonate solidifies, you kind of get this curved pattern. Well, those are both explanatory theories based on the same empirical data. The third one is in some ways the most important and I think the least appreciated. It's what I might call non-empirical shaping principles. Okay, so that's a mouthful. But simply saying, you know, this is kind of like the world view. If you're going to have this explanatory theory, it's not just hanging out there on its own. It needs to make sense within some larger context. And that larger context is generally not empirical. It's not something you, that you can go out and 100% nail down. But it's incredibly important because it is the backdrop against which everything else is measured. So let's see an example of this. Whence thunder? Whence. When's the last time you used whence? <laughs> a good word? I, this is one of those words you Google to make sure you're using it correctly. But whence means from where? You know, where did it come from? So here's one perfectly self-contained explanation. 
right? We all know that thunder comes from angels bowling. <laughs> now, think about this for a minute. What's the empirical data? It's the loud bang coming after the bright flash. Any of you come from the northwest suburbs? You saw a lot of this last night. You had terrible storms. Okay, what's the explanatory theory? Angels are bowling. That's what happens when angels bowl. What's the non-empirical shaping principle? Well, that anything you see in the universe is due to, you know, angels out there, they're moving things around. They're, you know, if I drop this, it's, angels are letting go of it or allowing it to drop it. They're pushing it from above. Or, you know, whatever your model is, maybe it's uh, nymphs and satyrs in the woods, and that's what's making things happen. But my point is, you have empirical data, you have a theory to explain it, and then you have this larger worldview in which the whole thing lives. Okay, what's a more boring way of looking at this? So, I pulled this from a meteorology website, and basically, you know, same empirical data, the loud noise coming after the bright flash. These guys and these guys are paying attention to the very same thing. What's the explanatory theory? Well, something to do with air density and electron charge. Ah, oh, right? Boring. And what's the non-empirical shaping principle? Well, it's the idea that science, chemistry, physics, biology, that should be able to give us, if we work hard enough at it or if we apply ourselves well enough, it should be able to give us an explanation for something like thunder, right? Imagine you've never experienced thunder before. It's your first thunderclap. You're probably, if you grew up in the society we all grew up in, and that's pretty much going back about 400 years, you would say, well, I don't know what that is, but let me call a chemist, let me call, you know, a meteorologist, let me call someone who, quote, studies the world, and we can probably figure it out. Well, that's a non-empirical shaping principle. And the theory would be kinds of things here, but the empirical data is the same, are the same. So how should science enrich my faith? If science gives me the ability to say, this is what I observe, here's a way of trying to explain it, and here's the larger worldview in which it all kind of makes sense, then it simply isn't fair to say there are two spheres, and I have one foot in one sphere and one foot in the other sphere. You know, when we're out at Mundelein Seminary, we're doing the God stuff, and when we come to Adler, we're doing the science stuff. We can't let ourselves do that and be self-respecting human beings. There's only one world, right? There's only one God. There's only one way of experiencing what there is. So then the challenge is, because we all want to kind of crawl into our own corner, I get that. It's one of my favorite hobbies. So this is, you know, subatomic, you know, colliding, a, a bubble chamber image. So just uh, subatomic particles. Well, what does this have to do with something like this? The horrors of starvation, global starvation. So you might say, well, okay, you know, faith definitely has a role to play in this. There's ethics involved. There's all kinds of things. Well, this is what's going out and, you know, used to be in Fermilab or CERN or wherever. What do these two things possibly have to do with each other? I'm not pretending there's an easy answer to that. I am saying, however, if they're not related, then this is talking about something and this is talking about something, but it's all in the same world. It's all the same matter. What is, you know, genetics, chromosomes, DNA? What does that have to do with something like this? Okay, so if you're of a certain age, right? Famous silent movie, no, <laughs> you know, the graduate, okay, and a wedding has just been broken up, two people love each other, they're together, but I always love this look on their face because now they realize, you know, they, they got to figure out something to do with their lives for what did we just get ourselves into? Every decision we make, free will, consequences, weddings, love, well, if this is about what we say it's about, then what does that tell us about free will? What does that tell us about love? And the defensive part of this might say, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, don't tell me that genetics can explain love, or don't tell me that just because I know your genetic makeup, I can, you know, I've taken away your free will. But nobody ever said that's what we were trying to do. So don't let that defensive voice, you know, push you all the way into a corner or create a straw man that you can knock down. But if this really does have to do with what we look like, and perhaps even how we think, that at some level, these two things should have a lot to say to each other. 
No, we're not at a point yet where we can completely map that out. But the scientist, and I would suggest the theologian, is fascinated by those questions. Okay, this is Richard Feynman giving a lecture. I don't know what he's demonstrating there. He's holding up something. And I just picked that because it looks a lot like Pope Benedict there elevating the host. No, I'm not suggesting Richard Feynman is, you know, consecrating a piece of chalk or something. My point simply is, what's going on in the physics lab? What's going on in something like a Catholic sacrament? And yes, for those of you, you know, out of that tradition, while nothing physically changes in the bread, it's transubst... I, I understand all of that. But what's happening is it's happening to a piece of matter. And, you know, if you know how matter works, there's little molecules of the host that are flying off of that thing all the time. So what happens to a little sub, you know, molecular piece of consecrated bread that now is floating in the atmosphere? Does that change the way you think about a church when you walk into it? Some of it is seeping into your clothing and you're carrying it out into the world. Okay, They wouldn't have known about that 2,000 years ago. I'm not telling you what you should think about that. I'm just saying that's information that science is supplying that should help hone the way we ask questions and understand answers in the faith. So, a huge gift that science gives to faith, I think, is the power of physical evidence. Now, can scientists cook the books just like everybody else can? Yeah, of course. You can be unethical and make up information that you think you've seen. But if you're a self-respecting scientist, you want to accurately gather information. And I'd like to suggest that it's a real gift to faith because a lot of times it both opens up possibilities where we begin to see God working in the world or possibilities for that that we hadn't thought of before, but it also helps shut down what are ultimately human creations, where we've decided, well, this must be what God is doing, but all of a sudden we get some new information and it knocks down a false perception. So a great example of this, right? Okay, here's, here's God. Um, God is all powerful and God is all good. God is all loving then it stands to reason that if you pray for something that is basically good, you know, you ought to get it. How many times have we heard that? If you grew up in the faith, don't tell me that there wasn't a time in your life when you thought, yeah, this should definitely work. You know, I, I ate my Brussels sprouts, I cleaned my room, and now I'm going to pray really hard. Jesus says, ask and you will receive. So for me, I remember, I, I grew up in, in uh, urban America, so I wanted a horse. I wanted a pony in particular. And I remember praying for a pony. Please, God, let there be a pony. Pony in the backyard. Please, God, let there be a pony. In the Please, God, let there be a pony in the backyard. Now, I grew up with four sisters, so my idea of a pony looked something like this. Uh, I never actually saw the thing that runs on a ranch. But nevertheless, please, let there be a pony in the backyard. At some point, and I don't care what your version of the pony in the backyard was, at some point you realize, I'm asking for this, I'm asking for this, it's not there, it's not there. That's empirical data. Okay? That's the kind of stuff a scientist goes out and collects. And at some point you simply realize, or you come to the conclusion, there ain't going to be no pony. Okay? Now, does that mean God doesn't exist? Of course not. Does that mean God hates you? No. Does that mean you have to deny that God is love? No. But what it does mean is that any understanding of all of those things that would equate to, you know, I'm a good boy, I pray for this, I wake up and I should get it, that data means whoever God is, however God acts, it's not fitting my particular model. Now I can choose to ignore that data, or I can choose to say my data proves that God doesn't exist, but there's real value in those observations. Now, of course, we know that for lots of us, the stakes are much higher than that. We're praying for someone we love to be healed from a terrible illness. We're praying for, you know, uh, someone who's unemployed to get a job. And it doesn't mean that prayer is irrelevant or it has no meaning. There are times when we pray and there's an outcome that happens. Obviously, this is a much broader question than we're going to answer here intercessory prayer, but I am just saying that the data are the data. And a lot of people trying to say, well, here's where faith and science get together. We'll do studies, right? We'll get 50 people to pray for everyone in the cancer ward, you know, and we'll get 
no people praying for folks in this part of the cancer. And we'll see, you know, well, and there's no correlation. Or someone will find something and will bring it forward and go, look, 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 this proves it, but it doesn't hold up to repeat experimentation. Well, that's simply helping us learn something about how God acts in the world. Okay. I'm going to watch a little video here. It's a cartoon, but it's accurate. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now, there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. Um, okay. I'm not able to pause it, so I just had to go back a slide. Quantum physics is probably the one area where I don't care how brilliant you are, every time you encounter it, you should still scratch your head and say, this makes no sense at all. <laughs> and the granddaddy experiment that really launched this is something called the double slit experiment. So I apologize for not being able to set it up for you adequately, but what he was showing you was the classical thing you would expect. Imagine you're shooting you know, little marbles against a wall, and there's one slit in the wall. Now you can just picture this in your mind. The marbles go through the slit, and on the back wall, what you get, if you're measuring where the marbles hit the wall, you just get a slit up and down. You know, you're throwing rocks through a window, you're only going to see the rocks hitting on the opposite side of the wall where the window is, more or less. When you do this with waves, like water waves, if you have two slits, you get what's known as an interference pattern. Watch this one more time. And here we are, the quantum granddaddy man. of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little <laughs> balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Nothing surprising. Now, expected. if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly. So there's only in one slit with you the get slit. One the line of brightness right on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. Nothing so now, special about this. You can do this in your bathtub. On the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this. Two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good, so far. 
Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> now we're going to shoot electrons, which are very, very small bits of matter, not An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense, but physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. OK, but now that's a cartoon. Here's the real thing case you're wondering. This is a real experiment with electrons. You're shooting them through one at a time. There's a double slit. And just as he was saying, so this is, you know, time one, you wait, keep shooting more, one at a time, more, more, more. And this is the actual pattern that builds up. Notice it's not 100% dark in between. Okay, this is what's famously known as the wave particle duality. If that intrigues you at all, and I would hope that it does, you know, you can go back, you can learn a lot about that, lots of videos and things to read. The reason I'm showing it, and again, I don't care how accomplished you are in physics, every time you see that, it should still blow your mind. None of us should get a good night's sleep tonight, having just seen that, okay? Because this is now over 100 years old, this information. People have been pounding on this, trying to understand it, trying to get it. The point is, you can explain it with a certain mathematical formulas to great accuracy. You know, the cell phone that uh, you know, you've got in your hand that's been turned off uh, for the last half hour, whatever, or you've been surfing on, that entirely draws on this kind of technology. Okay, so we can explain it, we can make predictions based on it, but at its very core, we don't have a good understanding of what's going on. Um, on large scales, like the size of a human being, or a puppy, or you know, even a, a fingernail or something, on large scales, you don't manifest this kind of uncertain behavior. You only see it at the smallest levels. But the large stuff is made up of the small stuff. Now, when you start talking about faith, this has all kinds of fascinating implications for free will and um, questions of certainty or causality. And there's you know, volumes and books written about theology and philosophy of quantum mechanics. The reason I bring this up and the reason why I show this to students at the seminary is it's very easy when you're doing God talk to blithely say things like, oh, Jesus is true God and true man, or oh, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, you know, three persons in one body. We use this language as if, you know, oh, hum, we've got that one all figured out. It's almost as if we've forgotten what it's like to just be knocked on our butts, you know, slack-jawed. I can't believe what I've just seen. Well, physics, modern physics, is full of examples like that. In fact, the average person walking down the street, I would suggest, probably does not have a clue the way, you know, kind of the cutting edge of science understands the world we live in. Whether it's this kind of stuff, whether it's relativistic effects, whether it's the way genetics really works. I mean, a lot of times if you just ask people, well, what do you know about genes? They may say something like, well, we're all descended from monkeys, you know, which is just completely inaccurate. Uh, and that, I'm not saying that people are stupid, or I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying 
if you really want to appreciate this, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, and you can get through life without realizing that these are the, you know, this is the way the world actually behaves. But when you sit down with it, it can be rather humbling. And I found, with seminarians at least, that's a great way to get them now thinking, well, maybe there is something rather amazing about this true God, true man stuff that we say about Jesus, you know? Maybe, because it's all analogical, it's, it's an analogy, I understand that. But the way matter can be both particles and waves, at least is getting your brain starting to twist itself up in knots the way it should when you say things like, Jesus is true God and true man. And I remember one of my seminary students, and, and everybody at Mundelein Seminary at least has a bachelor's degree from a major university, I remember him saying, well, how come nobody ever told us this stuff? He's like, well, you know, don't blame me. But it isn't something that, you know, and there are always going to be certain people that really get turned on by this kind of stuff and they dig into it, but it really should be at least broadly part of our common knowledge, you know. So there are things in the scientific world that I think can be very helpful in an epistemological way, a way of thinking that can be very fruitful about humbling us once again to be as amazed with statements of theology uh, like they were when those statements were first hammered out. Okay, so that's physics, right? Oh, huh. How about genetics? Well, what does the study of the science of genes, you know, what does that perhaps add to faith? Well, a huge issue is the more we know about genetic structure, right, then the question begins, does that perhaps tell us what it means to be human? Does it allow us to maybe even make predictions about people? So the Human Genome Project, probably you're familiar at least with, with the name or the project itself, this incredible accomplishment of being able to work out or map the entire genome of a human being. But if you can see this, these are books on carts, like the library cart. And there's hundreds of them there. And each one is about 400 pages. And if you opened it up, it would have tiny, tiny, almost like a telephone. Nobody knows what a telephone book is anymore, but almost like something really, really small. Really small print, page after page after page. That's what, if you were going to print it out, the genome of a person would be. Okay, fine. You know, I could easily imagine a person of faith saying, well, this is okay, but, you know, it's never really going to be able to explain what it means to be human. Now, a scientist might agree with that, but she would only agree with it if there were some reason for saying that. Because a self-respecting scientist would say, wait a minute, we've done all this work on the genetic structure, let's at least explore what it can tell us. I'm not going to be afraid of the information, just like the Vatican Observatory saying, come on. All comers, I want to hear what you've discovered. So don't shy away from the possibility. So just exactly what are some things that we are learning by looking at genetic structure of human beings? How much do your genes reveal about you? So one of the things they do is they take blood samples, right? They look at the genetic structure, and one group of researchers is trying to understand physiognomy. You know, what does the person look like? What are their physical features just based on their genetic material. So I'm going to show you some results. And this is cutting edge stuff. You're looking at 2016, 2017 results. So here's one example. This is the real person. They took a sample of her blood, and this is the prediction. Not exact by any means, but, you know, that's pretty darn far from zero um, level of agreement. Well, maybe they just got lucky, or maybe they photoshopped it when we weren't looking. Okay, here's another one. So racial characteristics are coded in your genes. Again, here's the actual person. Okay, nobody saw this person. All they saw was his blood, and then, or her blood, and then this is the, not exact, right, but, you know, close. Here's another one. Some of the things that you predict, you predict the sex, this is the height, Obviously, Europeans did this 1.76 meters, 1 point, it was actually 1.77. The prediction was 76 kilograms, actual 82. Age predicted 38, it was actually 35. The eye color predicted a little bit darker. Skin tone, pretty similar. Now, obviously, the huge difference is the beard. So there's nothing in the genes that can say whether or not a person would decide to grow a beard. <laughs> Ah, right now, every one of you should be hitting the ah button and not let me off the hook. 
I said, there's nothing in the genes that can tell you whether or not you grow a beard. There's nothing in the genes that were studied in this particular series of experiments. Okay? I can't simply say I don't like the fact, I don't want genes to be able to tell me whether or not I would decide to grow a beard. Therefore, I'm just going to declare you could never learn that from studying genes. The amount of material that needs to be processed in a human genome is ginormous. And, you know, this is barely scratching the surface, this eye color stuff. And so I'm not trying to say that the day will come when we could tell from your genetic structure whether or not you're likely to grow a beard. I'm just saying I do not yet have the grounds for saying there's no way you could possibly know that. Okay? And then just to see, well, does the beard make a difference? This is Photoshopping. And yeah, it gets you quite a bit closer. But the day may well come where all of a sudden, you know, somebody finds a certain genetic structure that we haven't looked at yet, and lo and behold, that predicts with 70% you know, likelihood whether or not a person grows a beard. If that day comes, there's no reason to throw your faith out the window. You know, if that day comes, that doesn't mean God has no role. It doesn't mean that free will or choice has no role. But how we think about those terms will have to evolve. Once again, science, good science, should hone the way we pose questions theologically and the way we understand answers. Jesus says, don't be afraid. So, scientific method and the path to holiness. Scientists have learned to live with the dis-ease and endless surprise of uncommon sense. Okay? I don't know if Grace is still here, but she'd be the first one to tell you. We love this stuff. We love when we wake up and nothing seems to make sense. After you've gotten your grant money. So you don't want to do this before. Before the grant, you understand everything except the one experiment you'll do, which will answer every remaining mystery in the universe. But to be faced with that which is uncertain. I thought I knew it. I thought I knew. All of a sudden, this has happened. Yes, that's unsettling. That creates dis-ease. If there's one thing I miss about my days of you know, going in and doing astrophysics all the time, it's that ability to sit in front of some of those kinds of cosmic mysteries. The reason I don't regret for one second what I ultimately did, which brought me here, is that that's all a priest does, is sit in front of mystery that is engaging and drawing in. And that's every person in this room, right? That's in your friendships, that's in your family, that's when you look in the mirror. The question is whether or not we're willing to engage that. Or as a person of faith would say, letting ourselves be engaged by it. They look for it, they engage, they try to understand it. They are fully alive when they engage it. St. Irenaeus, right? The glory of God is a human being, fully alive. Exposing a hopeless failure can constitute a good day's work. So obviously an artist's rendition of a black hole, you know, accreting some material, drawing out a high energy gas jet, and perhaps this is a scientist wondering what's it all about. <laughs> so scientific method and the path to holiness. Too many Christians cling to what they think they know about God, much of which has not been updated since their childhood. And their worst nightmare is letting go of divine familiarity. That's my law. You don't have to agree with it. But it's certainly been my experience. You know, that's the pony, the God who brings you the pony in the backyard. Can I let go of that with a certain ease and equanimity? Or is my universe shattered? Okay? So, some images of God, based on all kinds of reasons, the families we grew up in, the experiences we had in our childhood or adulthood, but here's one, right? God is just angry. All he's doing is looking for a reason to zap you, okay? Well, that doesn't square with the God you find in Scripture. It certainly doesn't square with the God of Catholic theology. But here's one that also doesn't quite square with it, right? That God is just anything you want. It's there. There's never going to be anything that's challenging. You know, both of these are different ends of the spectrum. And show me a person who all of a sudden has to undergo terrible hardships, and sometimes this one can fall apart. Or show me someone who really struggles to think that maybe this isn't who God is. And I'll show you a person who struggles to receive love, who maybe really struggles to see themselves as someone of deep, let alone infinite worth. Letting go of 
what we think is our divine familiarity can be a very difficult thing. And here's where I would suggest science has something to teach us. Because a good scientist is always letting go of her or his presuppositions. Not, like, not spiraling into chaos, but simply saying, you know, I had to try to piece my way to get to this point. You know, Jerry rigged something together, and now I have reasons for saying that's not quite the way it is. Science rests on the belief in universal constants and fundamental laws. So, the way a scientist operates is by saying, there are certain things in the world that I think I know is non-negotiables. This is the charge on the electron. This is the gravitational constant. This is the speed of light. Here are uh, Maxwell's equations describing electricity and magnet. There'll be a quiz at the end. <laughs> Here's the equation describing general relativity. The point is, there are reasons for believing all of these things are fairly stable and trustworthy. So when a scientist encounters something completely mysterious, never saw that before, what you start with are these kinds of things. I never saw that before, but let me see if it's charged or is it neutral. And if it is charged, I'm at least going to assume that the charges I'm measuring are, you know, multiples of this thing. Or I'm going to weigh it. And if it weighs something, I'm going to assume that it's following, behaving laws of gravity, you know, that I can learn from here. In other words, I've got something that I can stand on as my foundation, and that's what I use to encounter or engage mystery. So, scientists constantly push those universals to gain deeper understanding of knowledge. Uh, So-called standard model of particle physics really created a space in which the Higgs field, really the Higgs boson that was in the news a lot a couple of years ago, kind of made sense. The only reason I'm showing you this is to say that people looking for the Higgs boson had a reason to be looking for it, right? there was something that they were resting on that already made some sense to them, and now they were taking the next step. I find that people of faith rarely give themselves credit for the incredibly powerful, non-negotiable statements that we have to work with, right? Charge of the electron is great, but look at some of these. You know, strap it on and tighten it up. God is love, okay? That's revelation. No one ever reasoned to the conclusion that God is love. God is lovable, God is loving, sure. You know, Zeus had his moments, you know. You can reason to that. If there's going to be a God, then it makes sense that God is love. But God is love, okay? How about another one? God is a trinity of three divine persons in one being. That's pure revelation. Yes, it's the fruit of human intellect reflecting on scripture and so forth, but nobody reasoned from zero to a trinity. Okay? The Paschal Mystery, the Incarnation, God becomes human, really and truly dies, doesn't fake it, and really rises from the dead. That's a non-negotiable for Christianity. Okay? Human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, obviously going all the way back to the Hebrew Scriptures. My point is, not unlike the gravitational constant or the charge on the electron or Maxwell's equations, these are the things you, this is in your toolbox, you know, Christian. So when you encounter mystery, these are things to start with. Remember the, gra the, the picture of the concentration camp? My gosh, what, you know, where is God in that? Well, if this is true, God doesn't have the option of not being loved in some place. In the most horrible, despicable corner of humanity, if there is a God, and I, granted, I'm predicating all this on the existence of God, but I'm, I'm speaking as a Christian to Christians, or as a person of faith to people of faith, whatever it is you say about God, because this is what should allow you to wade into that miserable corner of humanity and say, my hope hasn't been destroyed. I'm not completely you know, wallowing in despair. Eli Wiesel, a concentration camp survivor, right, has a famous example of this. He was a child in concentration camps. And he, in one of his essays, he talks about a young mother carrying her child, and they're going into the gas chamber. The woman knows exactly what's going to happen, and she's comforting the child, hugging it, loving it. And he writes, it's so powerful, he says, nothing the Nazis could do to that woman could take away from her the ability to give and receive love. And he said, and that was her defeat of all the horror that was around her trying to defeat her. You know, 
obviously, much better if that never happened. You know, much better to prevent it from ever happening. But that situation could not negate this, just like you cannot negate the charge on an electron. If God is a trinity of three divine persons, then that woman holding her child in the image and likeness of this Trinitarian God that says all kinds of things about the power of the relationship between them. So what if you push the Christian universals the way a scientist pushes the universals of physics? Then we are hardwired for loving relationship. This comes out of being in the image of a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Spirit, constantly in relationship. Okay, And that relationship is one of love. This is very different than the Barney God of simply saying, well, you know, God loves you. Because when we say it that way, kind of the implication is, but if you really screw up, he might not love you tomorrow. I mean, this is saying God in God's very essence is this inherently relational expression of love. Now, does that apply to us? Of course. But there's a strength there that I think we often don't fully realize. Love is meant to be fruitful and faithful and eternal. By loving, we participate in God's identity. And the goal of human life is to become truly divinized. Okay? We often back away from that language. That comes out of the early church. We are not defined by our limitations. This is a fruit of the Paschal mystery. Right? The fear is that our suffering is what defines us. When Jesus is dead on the cross, it's lights out, game over. In fact, our suffering can be a threshold. It's not a brick wall which shuts us down. But take away the Paschal mystery and lots of luck believing that, okay? And we live in a society that largely says, you know, yeah, what you suffer is what defines you. Uh, and some people win the lottery and some people don't. So what do you see in the face of the inexplicable? A physicist looks into this and sees the emerging truth of the standard model for particle physics and the hope of a grand unified theory on a good day. <laughs> Can a Christian look into this and see the emerging truth of the Paschal mystery and even a source of hope for glory? Now please, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not pretending for a moment that anyone would look at this horror and come away saying, oh, I see the glory of God. Baloney. It is devastating. It is affectively crushing. But either everything we said about God is true or it isn't. And don't try to tell these people that they don't have the ability to love or that the love they share with one another is pointless or cheapened just because they're living in such misery. You know, it's easy, and this often happens on mission trips and things like that, right? Healthy, happy people go to the, quote, poor, destitute of the world, and they're surprised at, you know, how, you have no right to be happy. Why are you happy? Um, well, a way of breaking down that seeming paradox is going back to what we claim as self-respecting Christians are those non-negotiable truths. Okay? So learning from the scientific method, and just in the final uh, five minutes or so, what I want to do is I want to take what all of us learn, you know, the scientific method, and lots of us learn maybe a little bit of a caricature of it, but I want to take the way a scientist looks at the world and say, now what if you tried to create a faith method or a spiritual journey method? where you let the scientific epistemology sort of light your way. So not, how can I use science to prove the necessary existence of God and the folly of atheists? You know, do that and you'll get a PBS series. But rather, how can the way that scientists think about the world help me think more fruitfully about the God of Christianity? You know, scientists, do you have something to share with me that I could put to use? Not simply saying, oh gosh, isn't the world amazing? God must have done it. That's great. I do that all the time. I mean, I love just to go out and look up at the night sky. For me, that's a religious experience. But I'm talking about something a little bit more methodological. So, scientific method. You've got to know your initial conditions and your assumptions. So there's something called boundary value problems. No self-respecting scientist would ever look at a piece of data and draw some conclusion. The first thing she would say is, what's the boundary value problem here? Which is something most of us never think of at all. But it's simply saying every system exists within some boundary, okay? Great example of this would be a body of water. Here's uh, Lakeshore Drive. Here's Lake Michigan on a particularly clear day. Um, well, the little ripple, you know, a mile or so off the Gold Coast, 
the height of that ripple is actually a function of the shape of the shoreline. And oh, by the way, not just the shape along the Gold Coast, but toss in Wisconsin and Michigan and all the other insignificant places of the world. <laughs> all of that, now granted, the level of influence there is going to be infinitesimal from Wisconsin compared to what's going on right here. But the fact of the matter is, if you were really going to do the calculation with 100% accuracy, you've got to consider the entire boundary. A much, you know, maybe more, less interesting, but more fun, you know, go in your bathtub sub sometime, and pay attention to the way the wave pattern behaves, whether, I don't know, put your rubber ducky in it or something. I mean, mess with the boundary of the bathtub, and you'll notice there are different shapes happen when you splash your hand in the water. Okay. You also have to know your assumptions. I'll never, this was the first day of my very first physics class in college. Uh, as is often the case for those courses, it was taught by graduate students. Mine was taught by a guy who literally thought he was the elder Leo Tolstoy. If you remember, he grew that long beard. That's what this guy looked like. And he was kind of frightening. So what he said is, one day you're walking in the jungles in Africa, and you see a spotted cat, and you write down in your journal, today I saw a leopard. Okay? We're in physics, thinking we're all obnoxiously smart. We can't figure out what in the world is this guy doing. And he spoke very quietly. And then he said, okay, a couple of weeks later, you're walking along in the jungle, and you see a spotted cat. What are you going to write in your journal? We're all kind of frozen, you know. We took AP, AP, you know. <laughs> we, every, boy, I'm like, come on, what, this is what I came to college for? And um, I remember, but we knew something was up, because by now he was stroking his foot-long beard, <laughs> okay? And so he's like, okay, come on, you guys are supposed to be smart. You know, so we said, well, uh, you saw, you wrote down, I saw a leopard. And then he paused, right? So now you, the, the hand of doom is, is forming. And he said, I didn't tell you that you were in Africa. Now you're in South America. It's a jaguar, you idiots! <laughs> and I obviously never forgot that since, you know, 1935 or whatever it was. But his point was very well taken. Don't assume that just because you see a spotted cat, you know what it is. Your initial condition, where are you? Well, it matters whether you're in Africa or South America. Okay, silly example, but extremely important lesson. What are the spiritual analogs of this? Do you know your initial conditions and your boundaries? Oftentimes, those words are family. Who did you come from? What are the boundaries of your family? Where do you fall in the family line? I'm sure we have folks here who are counselors or psychologists, you know much more about this than I do. But that's hugely influential. But that's the same exact concept of how did you start out? How did you get to be here? When you decide how you love that person in your life, that is very much shaped by the boundaries of how you learned about love. It doesn't mean that you're a clone of that or you can't somehow transcend it. But you need to know it in order to understand yourself. What is your image of God? You can't possibly do theology unless you can honestly assess, well, here's my image of God. Maybe I'm going to be challenged to change it, but I better know what it is. What filters are on your heart? How honestly do you know yourself? How honestly do you know your family? Okay? I got a whole seminary full of guys, many of whom don't want to look at their family for anything. And I was one of them, and I'm still one of them. We know this is difficult, where sometimes there's a lot of messiness, as well as a lot of joy. What's been the most consistent in your life through the years, right? A scientist is always going to be looking for consistency. Are there elements of consistency? Scientific method two, data, 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 right? You don't sit in your armchair and try to imagine what the universe looks like. You, know, you can, but... Write a grant proposal and do that. Okay, data, data, data. Less should never be more. Okay, you should never be afraid of information. The Vatican says, bring me your best scientists. Bring me all the information you have. Rico Fermi, famous Italian physicist, lived his end of his years in uh, Hyde Park. His house is still down there. If you want to visit it, the people who live in it don't know they live in his house. There's no plaque or anything. How do you extrapolate or interpolate? So Enrico Fermi had a famous story about an elephant. And what he said is the following. Let's imagine you have some data, right? The x-axis, it could be anything. Maybe this is you know, day of the week, and this is temperature, or this could be the stock market. It could be anything. He says, let's suppose you have three data points, okay? 
Here they are, one, two, three. Fermi said, give me three data points, and I can prove to you that the curve that those data points represent are in the shape of an elephant. And there it is. Okay? Yeah, that, that's it. That's the stock market prediction for next week, because I've got these three data points. His point is, <laughs> no pun intended, if you have very few data points, you can imagine almost anything to try and explain them. Okay? More data is never, you know, less is never more. You want to have as much information as possible if you're a scientist before you draw any kind of conclusion. But it's amazing in the spiritual life what wild conclusions we will sometimes draw based on woefully little experiences. Okay? Also know your selection effects. To go back to the data thing for a minute, I know you all want to know about the Martians, but I do a lot of spiritual direction, okay? Beautiful ministry. But guys will come in and they'll say things like, oh, I'm not even sure I believe in God anymore. You know, I have no idea what God is doing in my life, my faith. And, you know, and say, okay, put the brakes on. What are you talking about? And sometimes it'll be they had one bad experience on Wednesday, you know, and you're meeting with them on Saturday. And they haven't even bothered to pray in between because they had such a, you know, their, their cage was so rattled. You know, it's one experience. Or, you know, sometimes somebody, a relationship falls apart. Now, why is God doing this to me? I thought God loved me. Well, you know, what are we talking about here? We're, we're talking about one bad experience. If you really want to get a sense of who God is in your world, you've got to collect lots of information. Okay? Selection effects also matter. Mars attacks. You might remember this movie from a few years ago. Uh, as an astronomer, I learned very early on there is life on Mars, and the only reason it exists is to attack Earth. We all know this. Okay, so in the most recent campaign, the Martians got together, and they decided, okay, this time we're really going to succeed. This time we're going to pull. We've seen all the other movies. Now we're really going to succeed. So what they did is they set a scouting party down. And they said, if we're going to take on the Earthlings, we need to know who the enemy is. So the scouting party, I want you to go down there. I want you to abduct you know, a sample of Earthlings. And I want you to measure them. I want you to, to see who they are so that we can defeat them. And so the scouting party goes down. And they start collecting samples. And this is just one graph amongst many. They want to see the number of arms and legs that Earthlings have. So they go out, they abduct their specimens, right? We've heard many people who've been abducted by aliens. These are just some of them. And two legs, one arm, there's a cluster there. Remember, each point is 10 Earthlings. Cluster there that have two arms and one leg. A little bit larger cluster of humans that have one arm and one leg. But by far the lion's share is this large grouping of people that have no arms and no legs. And so they come back to Mars, and they're reporting, you know, they're giving SAT scores, they're giving all the important data, and this is just one of the charts, okay? Well, this wise Martian general, okay, he's retired. He's been on all the previous Attack Earth campaigns. <laughs> and, you know, the scouts are giving this report, they get to this slide, and they go, look, you know, this is, this is their appendage situation. Most of them have no arms and no legs. And the old general gets up, he says, you idiots, I've been through this so many times before. Most earthlings don't lack arms and legs. These are the, just the ones that are easiest to abduct. <laughs> Think about it for a minute. What are your selection effects? Are you drawing conclusions based on data that you've gotten because that was just the easiest to get? Okay? And we do this all the time. I can't tell you how many papers have been debunked in science because people haven't paid attention to how did I get this data in the first place. You know, if all you ever do is wear sunglasses, you might come to the conclusion that it's a pretty smoky world we live in. Right? Until somebody says, take them off, stupid. And then all of a sudden you realize. Well, spiritually, God speaks to us every day. What do we receive? How do we collect that data of God's communication? Learn your spiritual frequencies, just like a radio. You know, you're not listening, you're not just listening to yourself. If you're doing this in prayer, your thoughts, feelings, desires are influenced by God. Now, you don't have to take my word for it, but do the effort of trying daily prayer. Take on spiritual direction. You know, talk to some people. Um, if you want to learn about science or meteorology, you talk to people who've walked that journey for a while. There are lots of people who could help educate us in ways of praying or thinking about God as adults. Pay attention to what matters to you. 
because that's really all you're going to pay attention to. And you're much more likely to collect your data, quote unquote, who is God, how is God acting in my life. You're going to pay attention to the things that influence you. And then we listen by articulating. Right? You don't just talk to yourself. When you articulate your thoughts in prayer to God or in conversation with a trusted friend, trust that what's coming out, what you are choosing to share, is influenced by the relationship God has with you. This works with the people in our lives. When I talk to someone, what I say is influenced by my relationship with them. When you talk to the person in the checkout line, you know, you're saying things, yes, different words, I get that, but you're saying things at a different level than when you talk to your best friend or your spouse. And then the last one, scientific method, explore. Every experiment or calculation is an analogy from the known to the unknown. What do you decide to tweak in your experiment? Are you open to the new? Can you allow the familiar to bridge to the strange? Are you comfortable with mystery? A scientist should be able to say, yes, I am comfortable with that. Yes, I do want to make that bridge. How about spiritually? Are you willing to test your faith? Put your image of God to the test. When you know that the result might be that you really need to perhaps rethink or re-receive around that. If God is consistent then, if God is love, then somewhere in that miserable concentration camp, God's presence is. If God is consistent then, as my life is falling apart, and the last thing I can believe is that God loves me, if God is consistent, then I have to even rethink that experience. If God is love, then take a risk and trust and evaluate. When you do an experiment, what you do is you tweak, you change something just a little bit, just a baby step, and then you measure. Take a risk in trust, right? The laboratory of faith is relationships, right? If I'm going to grow in trust, I have to take an act in risk. I can't, you know, there's no trust button on your back that gets flipped on or off. The only way to grow in trust is, you know, when's the last time or when's the first time you said to someone, I love you, and it wasn't your grandma. You know, it was somebody who would maybe say, well, I don't care that you love me. I don't love you. You know, what a risk it is to extend yourself to another in trust. But if God is all those things that we said, then the way we experience God you know, is going to be in and through, however imperfectly, the way we experience relationship and the way we experience love. And so that's the laboratory, if you like, for the person of faith. And there's certainly more that could be said about that, um, but that's the point that we're driving from. So really then, just to say in conclusion, all kinds of things we haven't talked about, you know, uh, I can't be the person to tell you uh, what existed before the Big Bang. Physicists can't tell you that. But I think there's an awful lot in the faith science dialogue that we miss when we just get caught up in the, the larger questions that, frankly, you're probably never going to get a satisfactory answer to. I'm not saying don't think about it. But there's this wealth of information that can come simply by saying, if you say, in this case, you're a Christian, there's so much about what we say about God that a good practicing scientist could help us understand to get a lot more out of that faith perhaps than we are.